So there is a total spectrum of what these substances that we that are exhilarating substances, these things that can cause your awareness to lift, there's an entire spectrum from recreational to evolutional that is possible for them to be employed. Welcome to Living with Reality, a podcast featuring archived teachings and modern conversations with Dr. Robert Svoboda, brought to you by the Be Here Now Network. Living with Reality explores Ayurveda and other wisdom traditions of India, which Dr. Svoboda has been studying for nearly 50 years. For more information, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Dr. Svoboda. That's D-R-S-V-O-B-O-D-A. Hello and welcome to Living with Reality. I'm Paula Crossfield, your host. I'm also a Vedic astrologer and business coach, and I helped Dr. Sabota build his online business. This episode is really special because Dr. Sabota gets questions all the time about intoxicants whether people should take them, what he thinks about entheogens, psychedelics, um, what is his relationship like with intoxicants. So this episode will answer those questions for you. He does so through stories and through examples, through the teachings of his mentor, the Agori Vimalananda, and you don't want to miss the story at the end, um, which is one that I don't think he's ever told in a public setting before. So, I hope you enjoy this episode. If you'd like to study with Dr. Saboda, he has over 200 hours worth of courses and you can find them at Dr. Svoboda, that's D-R-S-V-O-B-O-D-A dot teachable dot com slash courses. And you'll find things on topics like Kundalini and Tantra that really relate to the topic inside this episode. So enjoy the episode and we will see you next time. Vakritanda Mahakaya Surya Koti Samaprabham Nirvignam Kurme Deva Sarvakar Yeshu Sarvadam When we think about intoxication and intoxications in the Indian context, we need to go back to the Sanskrit word that is used to mean intoxicated. And that word is mada, or to some degree, it's all the words that emerge from it, like matta, which is a past participle, which of course is implying that you've already performed whatever activity is going to cause you to become intoxicated, and then you are in that state that is as a result of that activity. The root mud actually has a number of different meanings, uh, including (coughs) rejoice, exult, revel, to be drunk, to exhilarate, to inspire, to enjoy heavenly bliss, and also to boil or bubble like water. So, The implication, and and this, like many Sanskrit roots, if not most, have emerged from real-world events. And so the boiling or bubbling of water, that's what happens when you take the water, which ordinarily is sort of sitting, minding its own business, and you activate it, and you cause it to become more upward-moving. And once it becomes sufficiently activated and upward-moving, then it starts to go up. In fact, sometimes in Hindi, when you talk about an intox- someone experiencing a moment of intoxication, you will say that they've experienced a josh. And that word josh in Hindi is the word that you also use when if you're boiling milk, it's that moment when the milk starts to rise in the pan. So this, the implication is that there is a strong upward movement that causes an alteration in awareness. 
The word matta not only means intoxicated, it also means in rut, like an elephant or some other large animal. And the word madana means eros, the god of love. So basically, there is a strong connection between intoxication and kama or desire. Not just sexual desire, but any kind of desire. And there is, it does indeed appear to be the case that all living beings that we know of enjoy being intoxicated. There are many, many animals that drink alcohol whenever they can get it. In fact, um, elephants in South Africa are so fond of the marula fruit that the creme liqueur that is made from the marula fruit, amarula, has an elephant on its label because they are well known for waiting until the marulos have landed on the ground and fermented. Then they eat them and become tipsy. And a tipsy elephant is a wonderful thing to look at, provided especially that you are not directly in his or her way. Um, we also find other animals consuming other things. Uh, deer have been known to eat amanita mushrooms. Um, dogs have been known to get into the habit of licking toads. I once saw a dog in Costa Rica, a dog that I was very fond of, um, lick a toad. Fortunately, it was interrupted because before it could lick it too often. But just after licking it very briefly, that dog lay on her back for a while and was very clearly in another world. So this is a fundamental process that is characteristic of um, the vast majority of higher animals that we know, and is very, very characteristic of human beings. Possibly the best way to describe this is to quote from Charles Baudelaire, the very famous 19th century poet. And I'm going to read, he has a short poem, and it's called Get Drunk. Enivrez-vous. And it's worth listening to both in French for the sound and in English for the meaning. Il faut être toujours ivré. Tout cela, c'est l'unique question. Pour ne pas sentir l'horrible fardeau du temps qui brise vos épaules et vos penches vers la terre, il faut vous enivrer sans trêve. Mais de quoi De vin, de poésie ou de vertu, à votre guise. Mais enivrez-vous. Et si quelquefois, sur les marches d'un palais, sur l'herbe verte d'un fossé, dans la solitude mort de votre chambeau, chambre, vous vous réveillez, l'ivresse déjà diminuée ou disparue. Demandez avant à la vague, à l'étoile, à l'oiseau, à l'horloge, à tout ce qui fuit, à tout ce qui gémit, à tout ce qui roule, à tout ce qui chante, à tout ce qui parle. Demandez quelle heure est-il. Et le vent, la vague, l'étoile, le, le, l'oiseau, l'horloge, vous les prendront. Il est l'heure de s'enivrer. Pour n'être pas les esclaves martyrisés du temps, enivrez-vous sans cesse de vin, de poésie ou de vertu à votre guise. In English. Always be drunk. That's all there is to it. It's the only way. So that you don't feel the horrible burden of time that breaks your back and bends you to the earth. You must be continually drunk. But on what? On wine, on poetry, or on virtue, as you wish, but be drunk. And if sometimes, on the steps of a palace, or the green grass of a ditch, in the mournful solitude of your room, you wake again, drunkenness already diminishing or gone, ask the wind, the wave, the star, the bird, the clock, everything that is flying, everything that is groaning, everything that is rolling, everything that is singing, everything that is speaking, ask what time it is, and wind, wave, star, bird, clock will answer you. It's time to be drunk, so as not to be the martyred slaves of time. Be drunk, be continually drunk, on wine, on poetry, or on virtue, as you wish. On wine, on poetry, on virtue, as you wish. So this is the situation. Human beings 
want to have altered states of consciousness. And it is very easy to become addicted to these altered states of consciousness, whether they are developed from wine or they are developed from poetry or any other kind of art or they're developed from religious inspiration and exhilaration. It's very easy to become addicted to the experience without realizing that the experience is an opportunity to learn from it and to be able to continue in the process of boiling yourself, of preparing yourself even further to become even more and better able to experience even greater and more interesting states of intoxication on God. So Vimalananda, my mentor, who was um, very fond of intoxicants, always used to say to whomever asked him, because they knew that he his favorite uh, intoxicant was scotch, good quality scotch, And people would ask him all kinds of questions about that. And he would inevitably say to almost everyone, the supreme intoxicant in the world is the sweet name of God. Start using it. It will take you some time. But once you get into it and once you become intoxicated by it, that intoxication will never leave. I'm reminded of, I'm reminded of how Ram Dass once took LSD to Neem Karoli Baba, and Neem Karoli Baba took the LSD and all day long simply remained in the state that he had been before he took it. And afterwards told Ram Dass, this is very nice medicine. It will take you to where you want to go. I'm paraphrasing. It will take you to Jesus or wherever it is you want to go, but you can't stay there. So it's fine to give you a to give you a hint, to give you an impression of where you might get, but it's not going to keep you there. And this is the value of intoxicants. The value of intoxicants is to assist you to see the goal that you should be pointing yourself in the direction of. Vimalananda was of the opinion that intoxicants had another good use, and that was to make your nervous system stronger provided that you did not overdo any one of them at any one time. He was very much of a law of the jungle kind of guy, challenge and response. So he would always say when it comes down to taking intoxicants, it's a contest. It's a contest of wills, contest of wills between me and the intoxicant. Am I drinking the drink or is the drink drinking me? If I'm drinking the drink, its shakti will come into me. I will employ that shakti. I will offer it to the goddess. I will offer it to, to Bhairava. I will offer it to, to the supreme reality. And as a result of doing that, it will assist me to move my awareness into those realms where I can be part of that reality. If, on the other hand, I let it take over, then it will start drinking me. And then... It, I will come under its control. And then it will be difficult for me ever to get out from underneath it because then it is in charge. Sadly, of course, the vast majority of people who drink alcohol are being drunk by the drink. They are not in charge. They are not maintaining a clear and focused perspective of how much to consume, how much they can digest at any one time, and how to direct that energy in a positive direction to make it useful for them. In Ayurveda, we always uh, assert that every substance and every action in the world can act as food, as medicine, or as poison. If you were already someone like a Vedic seer, and remember in the Vedas, there was a very popular intoxicant called Soma, and there are hymns that describe the, the... the things that, the experiences that uh, the, the, the writer of the hymn experienced when he had drunk Soma. And there are, <clears throat> there are many, many descriptions of sacrifices in which Soma was an important part. And there is a strong belief among many people that Soma was not just one substance, but several potentially different substances that were used by in different contexts and different places 
by different people at different times to achieve the result that was desired. And that resu- result was desired result was to go into the astral world, to be able to communicate with the gods and goddesses, to be able, like the shamans in South America do, to go up and be given ikaros, sacred songs, to bring them back down and be able to use them on this plane, in this world. That's when, uh, that's when um, uh, a, 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 an intoxicant can go from being a merely a medicine to being a food as well. Probably my personal experience of the most, the, the most dramatic example of this uh, what came from Guru Maharaj, Vimalanandu's junior Guru Maharaj, uh, Jaktal Sadhu Ram Vishwambardas. And I, I knew Guru Maharaj for, for 10 years, I, uh, 11 years. I met him uh, at least once a year during that time. And during that period, I knew him. All that he would consume would be half a cup of milk, half a cup of water, occasional drink of some kind of cola. Um, But his only solid food was tobacco. And during the day, he would take, I would watch him, and he would take two big leaves of dark, dark, strong, dark tobacco, and he would tear them slowly into strips, and he would chew them up and swallow them. Now, if you've ever tried to eat tobacco, you will know that it is a powerful emetic. It makes you vomit but that never had any effect on him. And one day I was thinking to myself, how is he doing this? And Guru Maharaj, of course, was monitoring everybody's thoughts in his neighborhood all the time. As soon as that he ha- I had that thought, he said, what is the use of eating? You wear down your teeth. And he had two rows of teeth. His front row was all worn down and his back row was nice and handsome looking. You wear down your teeth, you wear out your digestive organs, maybe you pick up some disease from the food and it causes you to deteriorate. The best thing to do is to take something that is really poisonous and do internal alchemy on it and convert it into nectar and then that solves all your problems. So uh, uh, all I could do was put my hands together and say, yes, Guruji, because yes, Clearly, that is the best thing to do if one knows how to do it. So that's at one end of the spectrum. One end of the spectrum is you have such control over the intoxicant, and tobacco is a very strong intoxicant. You have such control over the intoxicant that it can become a food for you. At the other end, and unfortunately, the vast majority of people who use tobacco and alcohol and even um, entheogens, it becomes a poison. And what does a poison mean? It means something that is relentlessly causing you to become weaker and weaker, more and more fixed in your ways, less and less balanced, less and less able to be a responsible human being. In the middle is medicine, where you can take it and it will provide you with something that you had been missing. And if it is used in the right way, then it can have a very beneficial therapeutic effect. And Uh, Many researchers are now finding that a number of entheogens, especially psilocybin, can have a very profound effect on the, the, the chronic conditions, PTSD, depression, things that are not being, being adequately dealt with by current medication, by psychotherapy, by the, the normal methods of therapy that we have been employing for the past several decades. So there is a total spectrum of what these substances that we that are exhilarating substances, these things that can cause your awareness to lift. There's an entire spectrum from recreational to evolutional that is possible for them to be employed. Um, Ayurveda acknowledges this. Medicinal wines are very common in Ayurveda because alcohol in small amounts, and by small amounts, I mean a tablespoon or two tablespoons of wine with a meal that will activate your digestive fire, that will 
make your nervous system, both in your central nervous system and your gut nervous system, relax slightly so that the process of digestion will occur more efficiently and effectively. And so Ayurveda definitely believes in alcohol as a medicine. But a couple of tablespoons of wine, one ounce of wine is very different that from an entire glass of wine, which is different from an entire bottle of wine. So the dose is very important and the habit, the degree to which it becomes a habit is important. So if you're gonna take medicinal wine, you take it for six weeks or eight weeks and then you quit, then that can be very beneficial. You might start up again after a few more weeks, but you have to have some time where your system is not consuming it so that your body will have a reminder that it is not supposed to assume that this thing is gonna be present all the time. It's when you start to have to have that thing present in you all the time that you really start to have the situation where you are being drunk by the drink. That's what wrong use is. Wrong use is whenever your use of this substance causes damage to you and damage to other people. So it is very important when you consume any kind of substance like this, and you should only do so under the conditions that are going to be most useful, either therapeutic or if at all possible as food, generally therapeutic for you. That means you need to have the proper setting, you need to be in the proper environment, and you need to have the proper mindset. So set and setting is something that is now much spoke of when intoxicants are spoken of. The proper mindset is you have to know why you're doing it, not to, pe- not to try to simply ignore and forget your miseries, because if you're not addressing those miseries in some way, they're not going to go away. They're simply going to continue to accumulate. They have to be not suppressed. They have to be addressed. Or if you're trying to simply always feel like you're in a good mood and you're always using some substance to make you feel like you're in a good mood, you're not dealing with reality because sometimes in reality things are going to be great and sometimes they're going to be terrible. And you have to be in a position to deal with both of those states of being and not be disturbed, not be disturbed, not be distracted from your purpose in life, your dharma, your goal, your movement ahead. You may be temporarily, maya may temporarily take you over substantially, but you have to be in a position to emerge from it and not get caught in some some, uh, cognitive cul-de-sac where you're being afflicted by ideas that have taken over your awareness and potentially are being reinforced by whatever substance or action you're taking, because of course actions can also be intoxicants. Um, I knew a guy who once who ran ultra marathons and he had got to the point where if he did not run five miles a day, his body could not, he could not go to sleep. He could not, he was not feeling comfortable. So, he had become addicted to exercise. And now what's gonna happen to him when he can no longer do that? That's gonna be a big problem. So any activity, any substance can become an intoxicant. Any activity, any substance can become a food or a medicine or a poison. Alcohol can be a very dangerous and damaging poison. There are plenty of, uh, plenty. there's plenty of evidence. There are plenty of, uh, of, of, of studies that have shown this. Um, a, there's a very diff, great difference between how men and women me- metabolize alcohol, and it's very important for women to drink lots less alcohol than men do. Uh, it is uh, One interesting uh, piece of research that I have just become aware of is that um, when a person consumes more than seven units of alcohol per week, and one unit of alcohol is the equivalent of a glass of wine or a shot of uh, hard liquor or uh, a a bottle or or can of beer. When you consume more than seven units of alcohol a week, there is a strong possibility 
that that alcohol will be assisting iron to deposit in your brain. Now, we know that drinking too much can cause iron to deposit in your tissues. It produces a condition called siderosis, when in people who are chronic alcoholics can be quite damaging to their health. But the very fact that that iron that can be damaging to your bodily tissues um, uh, in your ordinary physical body, that it can actually get in past the blood-brain barrier into your brain and be deposited there, and from which getting rid of it is almost if impossible, if not actually impossible. And in fact, maybe one of the things that leads directly to dementia and possibly Alzheimer's, this is, in my opinion, a a truly strong reason to make sure that you never consume the equivalent of more than seven units of alcohol per week, which means definitely don't drink every day. You may choose to drink even every other day, but only one drink at a time, and make sure that you're always under that limit of seven units per week. Now, of course, Alcohol is not the only intoxicant that will give you difficult physiological difficulties. Um, people who smoke too much cannabis, uh, many of them now are developing um, a condition called uh, cannabis-induced hyperemesis, where they, it, they start to, cannabis often is very useful for suppressing the urge to vomit, but when you take too much of it, it can have the opposite effect, which is not uncommon with substances. And you can, you can get into a situation where you are always feeling nauseated, always vomiting, and there is very little that can be done to deal with that situation. It is very uh, recalcitrant, very resistant to treatment. So, of course, these are problems that we talk about in uh, in the physical body that are being made worse by uh, wrong intoxicant use. Um, another thing that is, uh, of course, the case is this can cause mental misalignments, mis mental diseases to become worse as well. This is particularly the case with entheogens, which are supposed to be assisting you to go beyond your limits. Often, if a person get, takes an, an entheogen once and then digests it over a number of weeks and months, that's a very useful thing to do. Otherwise, if they get into the habit of taking it frequently, often what will happen is it will dissolve the easy to dissolve knots in their personality, but it will start reinforcing the portions of their personality that are the re things that really need to be addressed. And why that will be the case is because if you, when you start dissolving part of your personality, your personality, in order to remain intact enough for you to work in the world, is going to hold on more tenaciously to those subunits of it which are still functional. And those may be the things you really need to deal with. This can also be the case with people who meditate. They will meditate, they will focus on a certain thing, they will get a high from meditating, and they will not be actively dealing with the things in themselves that they need to deal with. And this means that you, you can't rely on any of these intoxicants. You can't even really rely on meditating, per se, as some sort of thing that is going to solve all your problems. The one thing that could solve all your problems, if you were serious about it, would be to surrender totally and utterly to your Ishtadevata, your personal deity, and every thought that you have, turn it in the direction of that deity. Do not use your mind at all other than to move it in the direction of that deity. But being able to do that in the modern world is not going to be such an easy thing to do. Therefore, it is always good to either have someone assist you to look at the blind spots in yourself. Maybe that's a friend. Maybe that's a, a trusted colleague. Maybe that is a therapist especially if you're thinking that you want to use some of these intoxicants to assist you to see, a uh, get glimpses of the direction where you're going in. Um, when the, the intoxicants are properly employed, they can be extremely beneficial in many different kinds of ways. Um, the... The, the chief 
And most important criterion is they have to be employed in the right way at the right time. Vimal Ananda, um, uh, when I, after I met him for several years, insisted that I take no intoxicants at all. Afterwards, he insisted that I start taking them again because he said, this, is, uh, this has been a path that you've been on for many lifetimes. You need to be on this path again, but you are going to have to work hard in order to make sure that whatever it is you take that you are that is going to be beneficial for you is be- actually benefiting you and is not making things worse and he being a the kind of guy that uh he was he would often um cause me he would test me with these things um uh, whenever he would drink scotch, he would drink it slowly, and his mind, which was already always already very sophisticated and astute, it would become more sophisticated, more astute. You could actually watch his awareness being uh, expanding and being lifted up, and 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 uh, subliming. There's a word in English that applies to things like dry ice and mercury that. Um, the mercury will not boil, it will sublime. Dry ice doesn't boil, it sublimes. It goes directly to being a gas without any kind of boiling. So you could watch, and, and so we use that word sublime to indicate where the, something has caused our awareness to enter into a higher state of uh, existence. Uh, and we go back to Baudelaire, maybe that would be uh, maybe that would be whiskey. Maybe that would be poetry. Maybe that would be something of on the on the religious side. Um, so Vimal Ananda was sometimes occasionally would have me drink along with him, and he would and he would make sure to keep forcing me. He would keep he would converse with me. He would interact with me. He would force me to keep focusing on what he wanted me to focus focus uh, on, even while he was plying me with the scotch. Uh, I remember once, um, Vimal Ananda was a very eclectic guy and he knew lots of people. He knew Maharajas, he knew uh, 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 influential figures in the Bombay underworld. And one of these guys um, from the Bombay underworld was very fond of coming to him and testing him with intoxicants. and. Vimal Ananda was very fond of uh, playing this game with this character, who, who was quite a nice guy, really, at least with us, except for this tendency of always wanting to test him. So one day, uh, this, this guy had brought some strong hashish, and so Vimal Ananda told me, you know, prepare the hashish and fill the chillum, and we're all going to smoke. So I thought, okay, we're all going to smoke. So we all smoked the chillum. And then uh, Vimal Ananda said, now what we're going to do is we're going to drive uh, our friend here back to his place, which was about 45 minutes away at that time in Bombay in the middle of the day. Not that far away in distance, but in time. And <clears throat> Vimal Ananda would usually drive, and he never had any problem driving after smoking a chillum of hashish. But then he said to me, and today you are going to drive. And I thought, ooh, OMG. And, but with Vimal Ananda sitting in the back seat, assisting my energy to remain as it was, I was able to drive all the way through the most crowded part of Bombay in the most crowded moment of the day. Uh, This is something I suggest you don't try yourself. The only reason I did it is because I was told to do it. I was having assistance to actually achieve it. And it was part of this process that he was using to cause me to move in the direction that he felt I needed to move in. The point is that intoxicants, like any other substance and any other kind of action, can be very beneficial if they're used in a disciplined and focused and purposeful way. When they are not, they are damaging to to the person who takes them, damaging to the people around them, damaging to the world in general. And the probably the best thing to remember is that if all of those things you can be addicted to and intoxicated by, and that would include substances and poetry and arts and 
virtue and religion, the most important thing is not even religion, but the name of God. Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Narayanaya, Jai Shri Krishna, who, whatever it may be, whoever it may be, find that name that is the name that connects to you and ride that name to your goal. Ram, Ram.